Okay, let's continue and look now at algebraic models. So the algebraic models are based on Prandtl's mixing length hypothesis. Mixing velocity and the mixing length. And in here, the mixing length is dependent, it is not essentially equal, it, there is some so called von Vries damping factor in between. Um, that is the wall distance, but it's related to the wall distance. So when we come further away from the wall, then it's related to that, but it's not completely like that. And the, the mixing velocity is then determined by the modulus of derivative of the mean velocity with respect to y at the location where we are times the mixing length. So the idea is that uh, um, parts of the fluid are oscillating and then they are carrying with them lower momentum to uh, higher up or higher momentum lower, uh, further down and these differences that are causing the velocity then are located, can be then related uh, to, uh, to this mixing velocity that is then uh, in a way an approximation of the uh, fluctuation. So, um, outside the boundary layer, there are some closure models used, and in the end it comes down that we can compute the, um, uh, the eddy viscosity for the whole region, not only near the wall, but also away from the wall, as a function of the wall distance, you see it here, of the density, the viscosity, the mean flow and the derivatives of the mean flow. So, and, um, so this model is extensively used for compressible Navier-Stokes <coughs> equations and um, the model that is there most popular is the Baldwin-Lomax model. Baldwin-Lomax That is a model from the beginning of the 80s, <coughs> from NASA Ames, and that you can also read in um, the book by Wilcox. And then we can determine the mu t, as I just mentioned, as an algebraic function of the distance from the wall y, the density, the laminar <coughs> viscosity, the mean <coughs> uh, velocity vector, and the gradient of the mean velocity vector. So it, it just gets an algebraic function. And uh, then the approximation that we had discussed before, that is the approximation 20, that is also used for the Spala Almaras model is used. Yes? This one question for the new mix. Is it uh, like uh, the S L mix or is it times L mix? Times, times. So if it goes into mu, it is L This, this is the absolute value of the derivative of u with respect to y, the modulus, times the L mix. So it's L mix squared when we put it into... Yes, mm -hmm. yes, correct. Mm -hmm. So because you see this here gives us a velocity divided by a length, it multiplied with the length we get a velocity. Oh, yeah. So that's, that's the idea, and it is then by Brundle, it is this idea is essentially a velocity difference from a velocity uh, that is higher or lower below 
uh, or above with, with this length. So that is, uh, but it is uh, a length scale in the end. So we have here, that is typical. We have here a velocity scale and a length scale. Okay, so then it boils down to algebraic relations. We don't need to solve a PDE for that. We have just algebraic relations. And then also the approximation 20 that was used for Spala Almaras is also used with that model. And that is when we want to determine then uh, the um, Reynolds shear stress. That is where we use this. And then again, the kinetic energy in the um, Pusinesque approximation is neglected. So, that uh, you can read more about that in the textbook by Wilcox. Instead, we just want now to look at uh, the equation that we have not yet considered, and that is the energy equation. And in, remember, in the energy equation, we had a term that was minus rho Cp times, and then we had um, the velocity fluctuation vector times the temperature fluctuation. And that we have to average. So that is appearing in the convective terms of the energy equation. We have now brought it already with a minus on the right hand side. So that is in the energy equation. In the energy equation, that was the equation 9 that we discussed yesterday. And that is approximated in the following way. The Reynolds shear stress we approximated in a similar way as we approximate a Newtonian fluid, the shear stress tensor for Newtonian fluid. And here we approximate this turbulent um, um, contribution from the uh, energy equation as we approximate the heat flux. So where the, the turbulent thermal conductivity Kt is determined by Cp times the eddy viscosity that we have determined previously by one of our models divided by the turbulent frontal number. And where the turbulent frontal number, so the turbulent frontal number. at constant pressure times the eddy viscosity divided by the therm by the turbulent thermal conductivity where that is assumed to be approximately 0 0.9 so that was found that one can relate things so that is similar to what we observe for for example for air there we have a we can usually assume a constant frontal number of about 0.7 something 0.71 or 0.72. 
And that is also there a way to determine the thermal conductivity. So if we know the viscosity, we can then determine the thermal conductivity by that. And here is just the same. If we know the turbulent, the eddy viscosity mu t, the Cp is constant, and then the Brundtl number, the turbulent Brundtl number is chosen uh, 0 0.9, then we have this value. So we don't need to solve anything but this simple algebraic equation. So if we do all this with an algebraic turbulence model, then we get a very simple way to solve turbulent flow. So what we do is we compute then uh, the, the um, Reynolds stress in the way that we discussed with the Businesk approximation and we compute then these turbulent contributions in the energy equation as we use with Frey's law and then we can uh, solve the um, flow equations in the following way. So the Navier-Stokes equations Navier-Stokes equations including the energy equation are solved for the atomic model with um, 25 A that is when we replace the viscosity in the laminar for, for laminar flow by the effective viscosity by mu plus mu t that is the laminar viscosity that is the dynamic viscosity coefficient and that is the eddy viscosity that we determined by our turbulence model. In that case, for, for if we have it simple, just the algebraic model. And we replace then the thermal conductivity K by the effective thermal conductivity. Then we have the K that we have also for laminar flow and we add then the turbulent thermal conductivity K T. So then, things get extremely simple. What we need is, we, we need a, a solver for the general Navier-Stokes equation, including energy equation. And then, in there, we need also a subroutine to compute our turbulent uh, viscosity, eddy viscosity. And then we simply replace the uh, viscosity coefficient by this effective vis uh, viscosity and the thermal conductivity by the effective thermal conductivity. And that's all. And then we just go on and then we uh, compute everything as we would do for laminar flow. So that makes things then extremely simple. If we would use a, a higher order model, okay, we can also do that. So then we, if we determine that, for example, by the K epsilon model, we can do that. And then we have to check whether we still can use this assumption. And then we can just replace the k by k plus kt in the energy equation and solve that. So now we have to concentrate it on incompressible flow. When, we, when it comes to compressible flow, then we have to consider this remark here. So for compressible <coughs> flow, <coughs> the time averaged uh, Navier-Stokes equations
are similar to the ones for incompressible flow. as we would do in general, but if we do a little trick, and the trick is Favre averaging. Favre averaging is used for velocity, internal energy, and temperature. For example, for the velocity, that means the following, that we do not, that we define now something that we call u tilde, not u bar. The u bar would be defined in a similar way. It would be a time averaging over u. This is now different, and the difference is that we do a time averaging over rho u. Remember, rho u is an unknown for compressible flow. We have rho, rho u, rho v, rho w, rho e. They are, it's a conserved variable. It's the momentum per unit volume that we have here in the x direction. And that is divided by the, the mean density. Remember, the density is fluctuating now. So that is called the Favre average of the velocity. So that means we multiply the quantity by rho, do time averaging, and divide by the time average of rho. That is Faber averaging. It turns out that the equation <coughs> gets similar to incompressible. If, if we wouldn't do it, it, they would get more complicated. Let's try that. And um, we're continuing here on this remark. So we use Faber averaging for velocity, internal energy, and temperature. And we use Reynolds averaging, that is the time averaging that we have learned for incompressible flow. We do that for rho and the density and the pressure. So it's already, you see it here. There it is. And then the turbulence modeling for these the Faber average Navier-Stokes equations is very similar to the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equations that we looked at. So turbulence modeling of the Faber average. Compressible Navier Stokes equations is uh, similar to uh, what we discussed, similar, similar as what we discussed for the Rats, Reynolds average Navier Stokes. So then we have an idea of um, extending this approach to complex flow. So then we have time left for a more advanced technique. Now we have gone through all the runs techniques, starting from the Reynolds stress models, where we model all the components of the Reynolds stress tensor, the two equation models, K okay, epsilon, one equation model. We looked, uh, we mentioned also the spalar maras with the transport equation for mu t, the eddy viscosity, and then the algebraic models. Now, another technique that in the overview is more powerful than this one is large eddy simulation. But when we do that, we must be aware of that it means directly that we have to go from here we can solve for a steady mean flow. We can solve, say in our case, a 2D flow. We can solve a 2D problem. We have steady two-dimensional um, 
equations to solve. But as soon as we go to LES, we have to solve 3D unsteady. That is, they cannot go around that. So it becomes much more uh, demanding computationally. You need many more grid points. It takes much more computing time to solve 3D unsteady problems than solving a 2D steady problem. So that is the warning. Um, but computing power is increasing. So you see more and more of this. And that is the acronym is the LES. That has been developed over the years and it comes actually from a weather forecast. Uh, we we'll later on I want to look at an, at an animation from an atmospheric boundary layer <coughs> where this technique comes from. It was developed in the 60s. Smagorinsky was one of the first and he has developed a model for that for subgrid scales. But it has been um, become popular recently for wider cases, for wider applications, not the least for aerodynamic problems. So I just want to give you an idea of so instead of time averaging that we do for runs, there is two. Um, here for LES, some kind of spatial averaging. is applied. Okay, you can have different ways to, you can do that. For example, you can use the following. The general expression for that is for, we have the U component. Now the bar now means something different than what we discussed before. So here it means now a spatial averaging. Before it meant a time averaging. So here it is, an, it is some integral over the uh, R3. And we have then here some kernel G that we have to define, which depends on the location where we are, and some integration variable x prime, and some, um, some length scale for the problem that is related to the grid that we are using the delta. And then we are then integrating over x prime t and we are integrating over the, the prime. So that is our, our unknown. So it's a 3D, uh, it's a volume integral. So the, the d d prime then is the dx prime um, or if we have the components dx1, dx2, dx3, or dx, dy, dz prime, so but the prime variables. And g is a filter kernel, g of x, x prime, and uh, delta so is the filter kernel. So that is essentially doing then the spatial averaging. Kernel. And then we have, for example, we have the, the top hat or box filter that is essentially as if we would do a finite volume method. Then, um, for example, the top hat or the box filter. Top hat or box filter, that is the following the G of X, X prime delta is then um, one over this um, uh, length scale, this uh, grid scale, we should say the delta uh, to the power 3, 
if the x is such that the x component, the x1 component, is uh, just uh, the delta, uh, so if that is smaller or equal than delta half, and if the x2, the y component, if that is smaller than delta half, and if the x3 component is just uh, also smaller equal than delta half. So that means it is just a little box uh, around the point uh, x1 and x, uh, x1, with the components x1, x2, x3. And if we are in there, then we get just a constant. And outside it's zero. So, so outside it's zero. Zero else. So that is a very simple thing. We just pick up what is happening locally and do, do an averaging. And delta is the filter cutoff width. And, uh, and uh, usually the following is used. Delta is then the delta x, product of delta x, delta y, delta z, or delta x1, delta x2, delta x3, to the power one third. So then we have a, um, a grid scale by that. And then we do the spatial filtering in this way of the, our flow equations. And uh, for the continuity equation we get then the form that we are used to. So, uh, so the, these are then the grid spacing, I mentioned that. So spatial filtering of the continuity equation. that the divergence of the filtered velocity, now that is filtered in this way, is zero. So there is no difference. And spatial filtering of the incompressible um, of the momentum equation, so momentum equations <coughs> of the momentum equation as a vector equation of the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations Stokes equations yields the following number 28 29 is that so that we get the d rho u dt so the time derivative we have con uh, convective convective uh, flow that is rho u u and that we have to filter rho is constant if we have incompressible flow and on the right hand side we have then the divergence of the viscous stress tensor that we have to filter. So, and the filtered stress tensor looks then the following. Tensor and that is for the for the filter flow. So du 
i dxj duj dxi. That is a j here. And that's it. And the trick is now that we add now uh, the divergence of rho times the filter u times the filter u on both sides. equation 29, the filter equation. And we move then the, the term that we don't like, that we have to model, on the right hand side. We move the divergence of the row u filter, no, it's u, u, and the filter of the product. That is the term appearing on the left hand side. Of the filtered Navier Stokes equation. We move that to the right hand side. And that then yields the following. That is then uh, 30. That we get the time derivative of rho, rho times the filtered u vector plus, and now we get something that is related and that we can compute, that is the divergence of the constant density times the filtered u, filtered u. So if we are solving for the filtered variables, then we have that under control, just a convective flux that we have to compute. On the right hand side we have then the divergence of um, the uh, let's see, the tau that was there from the beginning, and um, that is this one here. Let's see, do we do things right here? That is there, and then we have here then plus the tau, what we call the tau, uh, tau s. And the tau s, that is then the difference of, uh, because we have um, added this and subtracted this. So then we, that has to be, uh, re be re uh, represented by the tau s. So where is 31? The tau ijs is then equal to the minus rho, and that should be then the uij averaged minus the u i u j and here we have the filter so then because we have added this term on both sides here it is on that side and here minus minus here it is on that side and then we have brought the term where we have to filter the product on the right hand side that is appearing here so that is called the subgrid scale Reynolds stress. That is called the subgrid scale Reynolds stress, and that has to be modeled. Of course, the other parts we have control, but this not. So that is called tau ijs. Is called uh, subgrid. Scale Reynolds stress. So that would be then the com corresponding component of, uh, of that. And uh, in the first and the most often used Smagorinsky subgrid scale model then this is modeled similar as in the Bosinesque approximation. So that is the Smagorinsky subgrid scale model. So that is what we need now. We need uh, to model this term. That is the difficult part. Subgrid scale model. So then uh, we assume that we have the following 
that the tau ijs is modeled by 2 times, and now you see here again the eddy viscosity or turbulent viscosity that we have to determine. And then we have here the uh, strain tensor tau ij that is here written in this form plus one third the trace that is the sum of the diagonal elements in the tau s. And the s here, sij, that is one half of the dui average dxj plus the duj uh, space average times dxi. That is the strain rate tensor. Strain rate tensor of the large scale field. Of course, that is with these. Of large scale field. And now the catch is how to determine the mu t. And the mu t, that is then uh, special for the Fabrinsky model is determined by the density, and then we have here some constant, and then we have here our filter cutoff width, the delta appearing, and that is to the power 2, and then the modulus of the uh, rate strain tensor, that is, the extent, that is the Euclidean norm. So the S here, that is the sum over all indices ij, sij uh, times sij. So that is de determined uh, here. So we simply square that and then we take in the end the square. So it's the Euclidean norm of this uh, rate, strain rate tensor. And the cs is a constant related to the distance from the wall and um, let's see, uh, and these are, well, I think, uh, let's see, do we need more? Yeah, that is uh, related then to the distance of the wall. And uh, that, uh, let me skip that. The important thing to note is now that in the viscosity, in the eddy viscosity that we have for the Smagorinsky model, this is grid dependent. So as we refine the grid, then the influence of this gets smaller. So you see, we try to resolve the big eddies, the large eddies, and the small eddies are resolved. And that enters here. This is related to the grid size that we are using. So as we have finer and finer grids, then the influence from the subgrid scale model gets smaller and smaller. And then more and more of the large eddies are resolved. So, that brings us then to finally to the animation here from that is from people from the National Center of Atmospheric Research in the United States. So large eddy simulation of marine atmospheric boundary S. Let's see how it works here. Yeah, you see here then an animation of uh, an atmospheric boundary layer that is about the sea, so marine boundary layer. You see it takes 12 million computing hours. So it's not a small computation, it's a big computation. So here the large eddies are resolved and the small eddies are modeled by this model or some better model than this one. And then you get uh, the turbulent structures that you have in the atmosphere above the ocean. And that can be, and it is actually used then for weather prediction. So then I think we have to stop here, but you can look at that yourself. So you can, with that, uh, get uh, details then of the turbulent flow. But you cannot get the very details because the smallest eddies they are modeled, then you have still done some assumptions. But this is, uh, uh, for many applications, far better than Reynolds average Navier-Stokes. You can do also unsteady Reynolds average Navier-Stokes, but if you have the choice, then large eddy simulation is definitely better. And as you refine the grid more and more, 
the influence from the subgrid scale model gets less and less, and you move more and more towards uh, direct numerical simulation. So that, and then you resolve all the scales. Okay, I think we stop here. And uh, remember, tomorrow we have also a guidance time from uh, 6 to 8.